Welcome to the last session of this webinar series on agricultural crop classification with synthetic aperture radar and optical remote sensing. This is Erica Potis speaking. I'm a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and instructor with the RSET program. Today's presentation is on biophysical variable retrieval using optical imagery to support agricultural monitoring practices. Today's guest Presenters are Professor Pierre de Fourny and Dr. Sophie Bontemp, both professors at the uh, Faculty of Bioengineering at the University of Louvain in Belgium. We're very grateful to have Professor de Fourny and Dr. Bontemp today sharing their expertise and knowledge in this topic. Thank you very much and welcome. Welcome to the fifth module of the training on the agricultural crop classification with synthetic aperture radar and optical remote sensing. This module concerns the biophysical variable retrieval using optical imagery to support agriculture practices monitoring. Sophie Bontan and myself, Pierre de Fourny, both professor of the Faculty of Bioengineering, at the University of Louvain in Belgium, we prepared this module based on our practical experiences in agriculture application for very different contexts. This module comes after four other modules and will focus here specifically on the optical imagery for crop monitoring. According to the training objective, you will know what is the interest of the spectral indices for agriculture, as well as what are the relevant biophysical variables. You will understand how to calibrate biophysical variables retrieval models and how to assess their estimation performances. You will then be introduced to the phenometrics and how they are useful. And finally, you will know how biophysical variables can support the monitoring of agriculture practices and how they can support also crop yield estimation. Through various applications, you will also be introduced to the open source toolbox like the ESA Send to Agri, the Send for Cap, and Send for Start toolboxes. This training module is organized in six sections, starting with the theoretical background on spectral indices and biophysical variables and then focusing on the methods for their estimation. Sophie Bontemps will then introduce you to the phenometrics to describe the crop cycle and the monitoring of agricultural practices. The use of biophysical variables for yield estimation and some, other, some open source toolboxes will be presented. To conclude, we will have a session of question and answer which allow us to interact based on your comments and questions. Let's start with section one, to introduce the spectral indices and the biophysical variables for agriculture. The monitoring of the vegetation development using the spectral reflectance can be done from three different perspectives. First, from the ground, by plant measurement which is often used as references for information, as we will see later. We can also estimate the plant or biophysical variables from satellite or UAV observation, and this will be also introduced later. The third approach is to use spectral or radiometric indices combining several reflectance bands to describe the vegetation evolution. These spectral signatures are the base of most of the vegetation indices. The spectral signature is actually the representation, representation of the reflectance value as a function of the wavelengths. These spectral signature vary according to the target which is observed and its electromagnetic properties. 
For instance, in blue, the water, in purple, the clear water have a very distinct spectral signature compared to the bare soil one in red here. The green vegetation is depicted by the spectral signature in green, which is also very different. On the display of the, on the image in near color, near infrared color composition, you can see that the winter wheat is going on. The winter wheat is growing while the sugar beet and the maize field are still bare soil. In the following months, the quick development of the winter wheat field make it more red along the season, while the sugar beet field and the maize remain bare soil as they were only sown in late April. By end of May, we can see the sugar beet field growing and the emergence of the maize field. This is only by early June that all the fields are fully developed with green vegetation all over. But as soon as mid-July, the winter wheat field is getting dark here because it is in a senescent phase. By early August, the winter wheat field is harvested while the maize field is in full vegetation as well as the sugar beet field. By mid-September, the maize field is already harvested and the sugar beet field will be harvested only by mid-October. The evolution of the spectral signature over the season allows to recognize the crop type, of course, but also to monitor the biophysical variables of the different development. In order to extract a specific signal from a spectral signature, many spectral indices can be computed. When looking at the signature of the green vegetation on the right, we can ask what is very specific to the spectral signature of green vegetation. On one hand, the strong absorption providing a very low reflectance in the visible band more specifically in the blue and the red band, due to the, the chlorophyll absorption with the pigment capturing the necessary energy for the photosynthesis. On the other hand, in the near infrared domain, a very high reflectance value is observed due to the spongy mesophyll linked to the internal structure of the leaf. This contrasts this behavior with very low reflectance in red and very high reflectance in near infrared is the basis of most vegetation indices. The most popular one is the normalized difference vegetation index, computed as a ratio of the difference between the reflectance in the near infrared minus the reflectance in the red on the sum of both. This is a so-called an angular index, because when we will see the evolution of the crop over the season, we will see the movement of the vegetation index around the origin according to the increase of the angle. Indeed, when the bare soil is observed, all the reflectance value align in the scatter plot matching the reflectance value versus the near infrared reflectance along the diagonal, which is corresponding to what we call the bare soil line. The NDVI is around zero. As soon as the crop develop, it will become greener and the NDVI will increase according to an increased angle up to an NDVI of 0.8. Similarly, we can build a normalized difference water index, which is based on the short wave infrared spectral signature. Indeed, we can observe three water absorption peak corresponding to the different wavelengths. Based on this observation, the normalized difference water index has been 
design as the ratio of the difference between the near infrared and the short wave infrared on the sum of both. This NDWI provides an information on the water content of green vegetation. The NDVI is the most popular vegetation index used for monitoring the vegetation cycle. Typically, a parcel first corresponds to a bare soil signature when the soil is prepared and the crop sown. Along the growing cycle, this spectral signature will evolve and turn progressively into a full green canopy spectral signature. Until it reaches the beginning of the maturity of the senescence, where it becomes more and more similar to a bare soil signature again. This most movement between the bare soil and the spectral signature of vegetation is typically on the basis of many vegetation indices. Some of them have been listed here and are based on the same principle but each of them try to improve a specific aspect, like for instance, the SAVI, which aim to reduce the influence of the soil background reflectance on the vegetation index value. On the right side of the slide, an NDVI image, I light in dark the pixel without or with very little green vegetation, while in white, the green vegetation appear. The NDVI has been so popular that now handheld instruments allow the farmer to measure it on the ground as well. Furthermore, more specific vegetation indices has been developed also, for instance, on the Red Edge region. The Red Edge region corresponds to the fast changing signature from the red to the near infrared zone. Thanks to the recent launch of satellites like Sentinel-2 and Worldview-3, these vegetation indices can exploit the Red Edge region, which allow to, to capture the canopy chlorophyll content and more indirectly, the canopy nitrogen content. For instance, the index of the Red Edge position corresponds to the curve inflection points, which will move from one position to another along the wavelengths, according to the chlorophyll content. Many very specific indices have been de derived from this region, the Red Hat region, in particular because they are less affected by factors like soil background, sun incidence intensity, and the viewing geometry. You can see here a list of them. This slide showing the NDVI value and the NDWI value for a given agricultural landscape illustrate what you can do yourself if you go on the Sentinel-2 playground, which allow you to select your favorite place and look at the different spectral indices value for a given Sentinel-2 image. You can even compute your own spectral index using the custom tab which we will recommend to compare to the actual image that you can also display. This is a very nice way to get familiar with the content of the various indices that we presented here. As you will see on the Sentinel-2 playground, many images are covered by cloud or impacted by atmospheric perturbation like haze or aerosol. Here is an NDVI time series for an agriculture season in Senegal. As observed from three different satellites, MODIS at 250 meters in green, Landsat 8 at 30 meters in black, and Sentinel-2 at 10 meters in blue. The solid line follows the most cloud-free images, while all the blue triangle, for instance, correspond to the Sentinel-2 images which are largely affected by cloud. 
you can check in the subset of the image how many times haze and cloud impact the surface reflectance. You can go to this ASA platform to select your own area and visualize any NDVI time series for your period of interest. The normalized spectral indices tends to minimize the residual atmospheric perturbation and the angular effect of the satellite observation, which is actually linked to the bidirectional observation, in fact. At the bottom, you can see an illustration of two images of the same field, but taken from different viewing angles. On one side, one is bright, the other one is dark, due to the angular effect of this bidirectional observation. This is a reason why it is of paramount importance to compute your spectral indices from only cloud-free surface reflectance, which correspond to the level called L2A. This L2A correspond to the atmospherically corrected surface reflectance masked by cloud and cloud shadow uh, screening. To conclude on the spectral indices, it is important to mention that the spectral band number record for a given sensor are not corresponding to the other one. As illustrated on many spectral signature here, the bands can be selected to be primarily sensitive to a very specific component of a crop or to be very specific to a given stress. Therefore, each sensor has its own set of bands, which can be combined into spectral indices. This is why you may find very useful the index database, which provides the formula of more than 300 indices for most of the existing satellite instruments. Besides the spectral indices, directly derived from surface reflectance. The other approach to monitor the crop rely on the estimation of biophysical variables. Unlike spectral indices, biophysical variables are plant traits or plant characteristics which exist by themselves and can be measured on the ground. Of course, they can also be measured or estimated by remote sensing at various scales depending on the sensor spatial resolution. These plant traits include LAI, FAPAR, F-cover, albedo, canopy chlorophyll content, plant water content, specific leaf area, and the canopy temperature. Each of them are related, is related to crop processes of interest for agriculture, like photosynthesis, evapotranspiration, or nitro nitrogen management. For instance, on the bottom right, the illustration highlight the respective spectral signature according to the plant health and the corresponding biophysical variables value. For the biophysical variables, the ground measurement is the reference. In remote sensing, ground measurement of biophysical variables serve as reference observation to be used for either calibration or validation. The challenge then is to match the scale of ground measurement with the scale of the satellite observation. To do so, we need to define the so-called elementary sampling unit which is described by the several ground measurement representative of an area corresponding to one pixel, or more commonly to a small cluster of pixels, precisely georeference. Indeed, in most cases, the footprint of the single ground measurement, like on the picture, is much smaller than a pixel size, than a pixel area. This is the reason why ground sampling 
protocols must be designed very carefully. For instance, here below you can see several sampling protocols within a elementary sampling unit, all aiming to obtain a representative average value of the biophysical variables for the entire elementary sampling unit. When it comes to the design of a field campaign, a list of criteria must be considered for the elementary sampling unit selection. First is the question of the number of elementary sampling units to be used for calibration or validation. In both cases, it should exceed 30 elementary sampling units, ideally. The location of an elementary sampling unit need to be at a, located at a reasonable distance from borders of a different land cover. The timing should be as close as possible to the satellite acquisition or the satellite observation. The homogeneity of an ASU will increase the representativity of the limited number of ground measurements. The diversity of the ESU will make sure that we cover the full range of the value observed in a given area for these uh, biophysical variables. Last but not least, the size of an elementary sampling unit need to be defined according to the footprint of the in-orbit sensor observation, which is defined by the point spread function. We will come to that concept just now. The size of an elementary sampling unit should be at least matching the actual size of the satellite measurement footprint, which is not, unfortunately, the size of the pixel. This would have been too simple. The actual footprint of an in-orbit measurement is defined by the angle of the instantaneous field of view corresponding to the optical system. The projection on the ground of this instantaneous field of view, called ground i will have an area which may vary according to the position in the image. Furthermore, combining these two with the ground sampling interval, which correspond to the density of reflectance measurement sample along the track, we will have all the elements which will define with the optical system the point spread function. This point spread function describes actually the response of an imaging system to a point object. The illustration here provides the relative contribution in the y-axis of each area on the ground for a single pixel radians measurement. We can see that most of the radians is coming from the red area corresponding to the ground i4. But the contributing area to this radiance measurement for a given pixel is also coming from the surrounding area to the ground i4. Therefore, we need to consider an area significantly larger than the pixel size when we want to do the matching between the ground measurement and the pixel level. As we know how to measure on the ground, now let's define precisely four of the key biophysical variables often used in remote sensing for agriculture. First, the cover fraction, F cover, which corresponds to the green cover fraction as seen from above or from the nadir direction as observed by a vertical photograph or a LIDAR. This is a canopy structural variable, which is dimensionless and independent of the geometry of illumination. 
while it's very sensitive to low cover fraction, it will saturate rather quickly at 100%, much before the full plant development. On the animation here on the right, you can see how to evolve the winter wheat green cover fraction over the season. A second commonly used biophysical variable is the effet par, or the fraction of absorbed photosynthetically active radiation, which is defined as the fraction of incoming solar radiation in the par spectral region that is actually absorbed by the vegetation canopy. It is a non-dimensional value ranging from zero to one for full green vegetation. Use as a descriptor for photosynthesis and evapotranspiration processes. This is a biophysical variable which depends on the elimination condition. This is a reason why we recommend to use permanent setup to measure the FA par as it varies along with the elimination condition. If you want to measure an instantaneous uh, value of the FA par, you can still use the linear set of sensor, like a septometer, allowing to measure the radiation above, like on the picture, and above and, and, and underneath the vegetation canopy. As this biophysical variable is directly related to the photosynthesis process, it's allowed to estimate the accumulation of biomass over time when taking into account the light use efficiency. There is no indeed assumption behind the FA par estimation by satellite as it is directly related to the electromagnetic radi radiation exactly like any remote sensing measurement. A third important biophysical variable is the canopy chlorophyll content defined by the total amount of chlorophyll A and B pigment per unit ground area. This variable is closely related to the plant nitrogen content, which is often used for fertilization. As illustrated by the pigment spectral signature below, you can see that at 550 nanometer, the low absorption indicate a rather large sensitivity to a great range of chlorophyll canopy content, which is not easily saturated, but less sensitive to chlorophyll changes. At the opposite, the absorption at 675 nanometer show a very high sensitivity to changes in chlorophyll content, but only for low chlor canopy chlorophyll value. This variable can be also measured on the ground using NL single leaf meter that measure the chlorophyll using a light transmittance system at two wavelengths. Typically, the SPAT or DualX instrument provide that, but this at the leaf level need to be combined with an estimation of the biomass at the canopy level to be able to estimate the canopy chlorophyll content. This is only this canopy chlorophyll content, which can be relayed to the satellite observation, which is here estimated from Sentinel-2 images in a rather very accurate way. The most popular biophysical variables is the Livary index, but this still needs to be clarified. Indeed, in remote sensing, we necessarily deal with the green area index rather than the leaf area index, because it includes not only the leaf, but also the stem and all the green elements of the plant. The true green area index is defined as a half 
of the developed area of all green elements per unit ground area. This can be measured by destructive measurement, meaning by cutting the plant. Most commonly, we use digital hemispherical photograph, like here, which provide actually the canopy fraction or the green canopy gap, I'm sorry, the, the green fraction or the gap fraction measure and estimate it based on a, tub a turbid medium assumption. This can be done by also other instruments like the LAI 2000 or 2100. When it comes to the satellite observation, we must talk about apparent green area index that depend on the assumption associated to the estimation algorithm, which include assumption on leaf orientation and on leaf clumping, for instance. Since we have learned about the concept and the theoretical background for the biophysical variable and the spectral indices, we can now move to the calibration of biophysical variables retrievals models and their performance assessment. There are two main approaches, the empirical models and the physically based models using radiative transfer modeling. The empirical models are calibrated on a specific set of reference data or ground observation. They are based on statistical regression or machine learning relationship between the spectral index value and the corresponding ground reference values. Once the model is calibrated, the validation aims to estimate the prediction error of the model using a fully independent dataset. The graph on the right shows the matching between the GAI, ground measurement, and their corresponding values estimated from the satellite observation using a stepwise multivariate regression. This is very important to understand that empirical models are locally calibrated and can be very efficient but are only valid for the area and the conditions corresponding to the data set that they use. And the opposite, the physically based models are much more complex, but transferable to other, area, to other areas and other conditions as they are designed to be very generic. Indeed, Physically based models are much more complex as they are built on radiative transfer modeling. These radiative transfer models are built on a detailed description of the structural and optical properties at the leaf level or at the entire vegetation canopy level. These models are able to simulate the absorption, the transmittance, and the reflectance of the canopy for any spectral band, for all sun incident angle, and all viewing geometries. For the leaf level, the prospect radiative transfer model is the most popular one, which is used in the BVNet toolbox that we will introduce here. For each possible value of a biophysical variables, and each observation angle, the spectral reflectance is simulated. All these simulations and the corresponding biophysical variable values are then used to train and to calibrate an artificial neuronal network, ANN model, to invert the process. This calibration neuronal network this calibrated neural network can then be used to retrieve from the satellite observation the biophysical variables value corresponding to this reflectance and this observation geometry. The model performance can be quantified at the model level by using only 
the input and output of the model, as you can see on the right side of the image. But to do the validation, a proper validation, we need to compare the biophysical variable estimated by satellite observation with regards to actual reference ground measurement, like here on the graph below. The performance can be further understood by using a set of metrics like the mean absolute error, the root mean square error, the bias, the error standard deviation, or the relative root mean square error. The graph on the left use dot colors to indicate the crop development stage corresponding to the sum of temperature along the season. It shows rather bigger error for the more yellowish, yellowish points, which correspond to the most advanced canopy development stages. The right graph shows the explanation by plotting the GAI error according to the development stages and showing that for the full development stages and the plant senescence stage, we can find the most contributing error in the model. Furthermore, the performance analysis can focus on the bias, specifically showing the overestimation for the early stages and the underestimation for the later stages. This analysis of the relative root mean square error is also very interesting on the right. It demonstrates that the relative error is minimum during the key development stage from the stem elongation to the flowering and the grain filling. This is very important to know this kind of difference of error to make the best use of this biophysical variable estimation. All these results presented here concern of course, the winter wheat, but they are very illustrative of how performance assessment can be completed. Indeed, it is of critical importance to always consider to validate the result of any modeling approach, as well as to validate for your own area any biophysical variable products that you may find from various websites. Before using a biophysical variable product, Please make sure that you read the validation report of the product you intend to use. I will now leave the floor to Sophie Bontemps to continue the, about the use of these spectral indices and these biophysical variables for agriculture applications. This second part will include uh, the section three to six that you can see here. Let's start with the section three, which uh, is about the phenometrics that allows us to identify uh, the distribution and uh, the timing of uh, the different crop types. We can start with uh, some definitions to be sure that we are all uh, talking about the same thing. First, uh, what is phenology? So the plant phenology deals with the definition of the development stages of the plants, but also um, with the recording of the dates of these stages. So phenology, this is the definition of the development stages and the dates of these uh, stages. If the plant that we observe is a crop, then we are talking about agricultural phenology or agrophenology. And in agrophenology, there are some conventional systems that have been defined, like the BBCH. This is the one that I have presented in the figures here. But uh, these systems have defined um, um, a, conventional, uh, um, a conventional list of stages and uh, for each plant, they have defined expected dates for each 
for all these uh, stages. And of course, this crop calendar will also depend on when, when or, or, so, sorry, will also depend on where these plants are, are observed because you will not observe the same calendar if you are in a temperate environment or if you are in a uh, tropical environment. So crop phenology, the crop is developing into several stages and for each stages you can expect some uh, period within the year. Monitoring the phenology is very interesting in agriculture because it will allow you characterizing the different crop types. Each crop type will have its own phenology and uh, it will also allow you monitoring the crop growing cycle. So to do this um, phenology monitoring, we will work with um, a time series analysis. It means, it means that we will not analyze a single image, a single spectral index or a single biophysical variable, but we will analyze all the, the, the suits of images within the year or within the uh, growing cycle. So to do this uh, time series analysis, the first option is to consider really all the dates. And so here, this is an example where um, you are com comparing uh, parcels of winter wheat and of winter barley. So these are these two crops are quite similar. And so you try uh, to find a good way to make a distinction between them. And so for each parcel, you draw your NDVI. Um, and when you compare these, uh, two, uh, these two cycles, you can see that in fact, there is a, 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 a small difference between the cycles. <coughs> and these differences uh, are located um, especially in the uh, period where the vegetation is at its maximum, so at, in the plateau, uh, this period is longer for the winter wheat and it occurs a bit earlier. And so by uh, considering these two aspects, it is, it is possible to make a difference between the two crops and so to do um, a mapping of uh, these two crops uh, and more in general, a mapping of the different crop types based on uh, the growing cycles of, um, of the crops and on the biophysical variables. Another way of um, analyzing the uh, biophysical variables time series is to uh, extract temporal metrics which are specific to the crop and which relate to the phenology. So when we are talking about crops, uh, there are some um, stages that always occur. So to have a crop, you need first to have a bare soil, which corresponds to the soil preparation, the sowing, etc. And then the crop is emerging, is growing rapidly, is reaching a kind of plateau, the vegetation is there, it is maturing, and then there is the senescence of the crop and the harvest and again a bare soil. For all the crops, these successive stages happen. What will differ is the dates of the crop, and also maybe the amplitude of the vegetation, the difference between uh, the uh, bare soil and the maximum vegetation. And so you can extract some phenometrics, some uh, yeah, met metrics that um, will allow you make, making the difference between the different crops. So for instance, here you get the maximum red, so which corresponds to the period where the soil is bare. So to, to, to have the period where the soil is bare, you look for uh, the maximum red values. To know the period of the uh, vegetation emergence, uh, the, the, where the vegetation is growing, you, you could look at the uh, positive slope of uh, your NDVI or your biophysical variable. For the senescence, it would be the maximum negative slope, where the vegetation is it is, uh, is um, in place, you could look at the maximum NDVI uh, and after the harvest, the minimum NDVI. So this is possible to make a relationship between the phenological stages and the re uh, reflectance signal. And this is what we call um, the uh, phenometrics or the crop specific temporal metrics. Here is an example. Uh, you are interested in the start of the season. So the start of the season, you can choose how you define it. Either you define it by a local criteria, you define your start of the season by uh, 
this is when NDVI or EVI or LEI, whatever, is reaching a certain threshold. So this is an absolute threshold. You can also define it as a relative threshold. So the start of the season is reached when uh, the NDVI has um, reached the uh, 10, 20 percent of the amplitude. So if you are working like this, you need to know the amplitude. So it means that you need to wait for at least the mid middle of the season. Or you can uh, you can forget the threshold and just make a curve analysis and look at the derivative to find the inflection points. So there are different ways of defining the phenometrics. The idea of the phenometrics is just to link the phenological stages with um, a spectrotemporal signal in your biophysical variables. Some applications now um, uh, with these phenometrics. The first one is um, a rice calen crop calendar, a uh, dynamic rice calendar. So to do so, uh, we have been working in different regions of the world and we have been working with uh, vegetation indices, NDVI or EVI. So you see here in a green, the vegetation index of the rice. So a bare soil, the crop is emerging, rapidly growing. Then this is the heading, the senescence of the rice, and then the harvest, and again a rare soil. And because we are talking about rice, we are talking also about flooding. And so you can see here in a dark blue, the water signal. So based on the vegetation signal, you can define your phenometrics corresponding to uh, the bare soil and the flooding, then the emergence of the crop corresponding to the start of the season, the heading corresponding to the maximum of the vegetation index and the maturity corresponding here uh, when uh, the senescence um, has happened. We have identified all these uh, phenometrics in different um, countries and located in different environments, temperate environment with uh, one season of rice in Spain and Turkey, the same in, in the tropical environment in Bangladesh. Then we tackled some uh, more tricky regions, some tricky countries uh, where the, in fact the rice uh, was the sudden crop coming after a winter crop. So we need to really to uh, identify the good season where to look for the uh, phenometrics. And then uh, there were again a bit more of complexity in the tropical um, in the tropical region where then you can have two or three successive rises and so you have uh, different cycles to be analyzed. But so it means that with these, these analyses you get the dates of the different stages in the different countries in the different regions and having these dates you can build maps and this is what becomes interesting you can for each phenometric, so for each phenological stages, uh, you can build a map. Uh, here you get uh, the sowing, the days of sowing, the days of heading, uh, and for this is for each year. And then you can compare each year with the previous one and try to identify uh, anomalies. So here, this is an example in Italy. For the sowing, you can see that uh, the year 2013 uh, is a bit uh, abnormal, meaning that the sowing was later than usual. So this was the case because in 2013 the um, spring was uh, really humid, a lot of rainfall, and so the sowing uh, had to had to take place uh, a bit later. For the heading, in, this is uh, uh, the opposite. In 2003, we can observe that this year the, the heading was uh, very early, which corresponds to a, a year which was very hot. And so with these anomalies, you can um, provide information about the uh, information, uh, sorry, you can provide information about the, um, the status of the crop, the growing cycle of the crop, and uh, this, is, this, this uh, feeds early warning system operational early warning systems that uh, each country or each region has. This was the first example in, in with the rice. A second example, uh, more or less uh, in, let's say, the same uh, vein, but we are in South Africa with the maize, and here uh, we were able to map uh, the emergence date of uh, the maize. And so you, what is really, really interesting is to see that there is here a clear uh, gradient between the western and the eastern part 
uh, where uh, in the western part we can see that the uh, emergence is uh, significantly later than the eastern part. So this is probably due to the climate, uh, a climate effect. Uh, and so we can see that the maize comes earlier in the eastern part. Another current of application with the phenometrics. So we are no more at a regional scale. We are now at a much uh, smaller scale at the farm level or at even at the field level. And we can, in fact, characterize the phenological stages at the level of the field during the season. And we can do, again, some mapping, characterizing here, so uh, the, the tilling, flowering, uh, maturity, the length of the vegetation period, and we can uh, see that this is quite consistent. And what is even more interesting is that when you uh, compare these phenological maps with um, a map of the cultivated varieties, you can see that there is some uh, correlation. So here, for instance, uh, the variety which is named uh, Nemesi, we can observe that um, they are quite uh, consistent and different from the others in terms of phenological stages. So mapping with the phenometrics will also allow you to reach a high level of uh, crop characterization uh, uh, within um, your mapping exercises. This is possible, of course, because we are working at the uh, field level and so because we are working at the uh, with a high spatial resolution data. So if we would be working with a coarser spatial resolution data, that would not be the case because here the signal would be mixed. And so the different varieties, even sometimes the different crop species would be uh, would be merged in a single uh, in a single pixel. And now we will move to the uh, next section about the agricultural practices. So. There are different kinds of agricultural practices uh, that can be monitored with the biophysic physical variables. So the idea of the um, agricultural practices is that you don't want to know only if you are observing wheat or, uh, or barley or rice or sunflower, but you are interested in knowing what is happening at the field level, what is happening in your field. And so again, this kind of application is only possible because we are working at high spatial resolution and so because we have a signal which is uh, field specific and so crop specific. A first agricultural practice that we can monitor with the biophysical variables or the spectral indices in agriculture is uh, the uh, mowing in the pound and grassland. So this is a picture of the mowing. So what are we looking for to detect the mowing? We are looking here, this is NDVI, but could also be the LEI, for instance, because the LEI is a good proxy of the, uh, of the biomass. So a permanent grassland, which is not mown, would have this kind of signal, NDVI, which is growing and which remains high during the whole rain season. When there is a mowing, what we observe is that we have significant decrease and drops of the signal several times during the year. And so these drops correspond, in fact, to a mowing event. So this is what we need to look at when we are uh, trying to detect mowing events. This is another example of, uh, of an NDVI curve for a mowing. So this is uh, increasing when we so we are in Europe, so when we uh, are in April, we are close to the maximum. It remains high and then we have two drops, rapid drops, which happens in June and in July, which uh, correspond to the mowing. And when you look at the images, you can uh, clearly see that the vegetation which was in place on the 11th of June has been removed on the 19th of June and the same between the 26th of July and the 5th of August. So this is what we are uh, looking at, and this is what we can detect by just uh, looking for NDVI or LAI uh, significant decreases in the time profile. So this is an example of a profile. Here in green, you get the NDVI profile. We are in Spain, 
in Spain there is a lot of sun, not a lot of clouds, and so you have your NDVI signal, which is uh, quite uh, complete. There is not a lot of gaps, not many gaps. Uh, and um, a profile of a permanent grassland would have been like this, but here, so very high. But here we can see that four times during the season we have a drop. And these drops are detected as mowing events. This is the yellow uh, peaks that you can see here. These graphics were uh, in fact done in a project which is named Send for Cap and in which we uh, had the chance to go to the fields and to receive ground data. And so the ground data are the blue, um, the blue dots. And so we can see that uh, on the ground, we know that there were indeed four mowing events in this parcel. And so there is a good matching between the drops of NDVI and uh, the, uh, the ground data. The same, uh, so this is, this, uh, these mooring events are confirmed when you look at very high spatial resolution data. Here, this is the planet you can see just before and after uh, the detection dates, you can see that the vegetation has been mown for each date. This is another example, exact, exactly so the same, uh, the same kind of profile and the same algorithm, but we are in Netherlands. So Netherlands um, is not like Spain. You, we have some cloud coverage, significant cloud coverage. And so you can see here that in your NDVI profile, you have some gaps where you have no information because the images were covered by cloud. So where we have information, where we have cloud-free observations, we are able to detect some uh, NDVI decreases, one, two, and three, which are detected as moving events. And when we compare to ground data, this uh, matches quite well. This is also visible on the planet data. But still, there is one moving event that comes from the ground data that was not detected from Sentinel-2. So this is a limitation of working with optical data. You can analyze your profile, you can monitor your agricultural practices, but you uh, are forced to um, only focus your analysis when there is no cloud. So something maybe just for your information. Uh, here we focused on Sentinel-2 for the biophysical variables. Uh, um, uh, we focused on optical data, sorry, for the biophysical variables and uh, uh, spectral indices, but we can have the same kind of uh, variables, matrix, also coming from SAR data. So Sentinel-1, for instance, in this case, SAR data, which are, are not sensitive to the cloud coverage and which uh, when we have uh, uh, meaningful SAR, um, SAR matrix, in this case is the coherence, we can detect also the agricultural practices. So here, this is the coherence. I don't know if you uh, heard about it during uh, the previous uh, lessons, uh, but the idea with the coherence is that um, the coherence measures how your field remains the same between two successive observations. And so if there is a mowing, the coherence should decrease. And so this is uh, here what we uh, observed between these and these. There is a decrease of the coherence and then when the vegetation is regrowing, an increase. So this is vegetation, bare soil, and then there is again vegetation, vegetation. And the same here for all the uh, detections. So this is just to, to tell you that we focused a lot on optical data, but the same is possible also uh, with uh, SAR data. A second agricultural practice that we can uh, detect using biophysical variables is the harvest. So if you have a field with uh, uh, annual crop, an annual crop, you can uh, look for uh, the harvest and detecting also the date. So here you can see that we are still uh, in the project center cap, which is making use of optical and SAR data but maybe we can focus only on the uh, NDVI, which is the, opti the optical um, spectral index that we have introduced in, in, in this lesson. 
And so the rationale of, of the harvest date detection is that you have your crop which is in place, vegetation is growing, then you should have the vegetation which is high and remains high during a certain number of dates and suddenly having a decrease, a sudden decrease. This is not just the vegetation which is drying, but the vegetation is cut. And so to have the harvest detection, you need two conditions, having high vegetation during a certain dates and then your sudden decrease to a, a, low, a low level of vegetation. And then when you have these two conditions, which are uh, true, these are the condition one and two, the matrix one and two. The other ones are from Sentinel-1 data. From NDVI, this is the matrix one and two. When you have these two, two metrics which are true, then the harvest is detected and you can find the date. So you can see here on the animation, uh, the uh, very high resolution imagery corresponding to the different dates and where you can see the, the harvest clearly. In this example, we were not only interested in the harvest dates of the main crops, but we were we wanted also to know if a cover crop was planted after the main crop. And so this is why we analyzed the uh, period which is in gray. And we wanted to know if during this period a second crop was sown meaning that again we define some uh, some metrics where we wanted to know if the NDVI was increasing during this period and not harvested, so not uh, decreasing. So with this uh, rationale, in fact, you can do some uh, monitoring here, this is an example of our three fields, but uh, you can do it in national scale. Uh, and this is a, a monitoring um, of the uh, growing cycle of your crop. You can see your NDVI is increasing, reaching high values. And then when this is significantly decreasing, this is the harvest. You can use the profile that you got before the harvest to identify which crop type it is. So in this case, we uh, identify the winter wheat, the spring wheat uh, in the different parcels. And then you can look if you have during a given period, a cash crop or cover crop, which is in place, which was the case in two parcels, but probably not uh, in this one. So just monitoring your biophysical variables, the tendencies in the time series, you can understand you can monitor a lot of things that is happening uh, on the field. Another kind of event that we can detect is the plowing or the tillage. So here again, we are looking for uh, NDVI time series or could be LAI. And uh, here, this is an example where the plowing just occurred immediately after the harvest. So we can see again, a, a, the decrease took place and again we had a stronger decrease. This is visible also on the images. Sometimes uh, you have uh, the tillage which is occurring not just after the harvest but a bit later and so here the rationale, so again the green line is the NDVI, so the rationale for detecting the tillage is that uh, after it happens after the harvest, so your, N your NDVI should remain low. And then to detect the tillage, here in this case, uh, only NDVI is not enough, only optical data is not enough. You should introduce also some SAR data and look for some uh, signal in the backscatter and the current time series. So the backscatter should remain high. This is what you observe here. And the currents should increase and then decrease to a stable signal. And this is the combination of these metrics that allows you detecting um, the, the tillage. So this is sometimes quite simple, like for the mowing events, you can just look for a decrease of NDVI, but depending on the event that you would like to monitor, on the practice that you would like to monitor, sometimes you need to introduce more information, more metrics, coming from optical, coming from SAR, etc. You could also need sometimes to introduce different variables uh, to, um, 
to, to consolidate your, your detection. A last example of the of agricultural practices that uh, you can monitor. Uh, this is the fertilization, and this is here an example in Mali in small uh, holding agriculture. And so here uh, the study used Sentinel-2 data at 10 meters, but it also used a very high resolution data at one meters. So this is a combination of, of um, the uh, two images. <coughs> and here, this is the NDVI which was analyzed, and we compared the NDVI uh, behavior on parcels which were not fertilized, the, this is the A and B, and also on parcels that were fertilized, and we could see an impact uh, on, 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 on the a clear impact, visible impact, on the NDVI when there is a fertilization uh, which is applied. And so you can uh, make a difference between the fields that receive some, in some inputs and the fields that uh, do not uh, receive anything. Another kind of application which is uh, about the usefulness of the biophysical variables to support the yield estimation. So if you uh, are interested in, in crop yield estimation, you probably know that for the moment um, there is no methodology which is fully operational with high resolution data. So estimating crop yield from high resolution data is uh, under investigation. There are some methodologies which are emerging, but they are not yet fully tuned and they are not yet fully understood. So mostly, with high resolution data, we are still in the R&D domain. Operational system for the crop yield estimation are based on core source partial resolution data, typically the MODIS time series. Um, and so they have to deal with the fact that with this partial resolution, you cannot get a crop specific signal. It means that if you are working at 250 meters, the, the, the pixel that you observe in many, in, in most parts of the world, the pixel that you observe is not a single field, it's not a unique field. This is a set of fields, and most probably these fields are covered by different crop types. So the signal that you observed is certainly a cropland, but you don't know exactly which crop it is. This is a mix of crops. And so this is a, a, a real limitation of uh, working. Um, this is a real limit, limitation. And, and this limitation has uh, an impact on the usefulness of the signal. And so in this operational signal, um, the uh, way the MODIS data are used, this is not to, this is not, uh, to um, find a clear link between the biophysical variables and the crop yield, but this is uh, to assess the crop conditions, the crop growing cycle, uh, based on the biophysical variables, time series, and to detect any anomalies that could have an impact on the production at the end of the season. So we will have a look, uh, we will have here an example. We are um, We are uh, in the um, on the website of the uh, crop monitor of the GeoGlam uh, initiative, and so this uh, crop monitor website aims at providing each month a, con a synthesis of the crop conditions uh, all over the world. So they are focusing on on four uh, main uh, crop, con cro crop type, uh, and uh, for each crop type, they uh, provide the crop conditions which are categorized into different groups, which you can see here. So the methodology they are using, so first they are analyzing remote sensing data, NDVI, but also precipitation, temperature, soil moisture, evapotranspiration and runoff. For the NDVI, each month they do a map to uh, be informed about the amount of vegetation in each place of the world. And most importantly, from this map, they compare with the previous years, and so they can create a map of anomalies. They can detect areas in the world where the vegetation is not growing as usual. 
And so they can interpret these maps of NDVI anomalies. They can interpret it and they can also integrate this information with uh, other information coming from the other parameters. And the way they do that, so they, 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 they collect all the information and then each month they organize a teleconference, a meeting between analysts and uh, these analysts try to assess the impact of any anomaly on the uh, crop production at the end of the season. And so these analyses and these uh, impacts are published in bulletins. So here, uh, that, that this is an example. Uh, so they are doing this kind of, of analysis for each region of the world and for each crop. And so here, this is an example uh, in East Africa for maize. You can see that the conditions are pro in some region of, uh, of, the, of the area. Uh, some region of, the, uh, of East Africa uh, are uh, under observation. And so on this, they can uh, elaborate a bit more and they publish their uh, estimation, their best guess of what will be the crop production at the end of the season. So this is uh, the way uh, the way the EO data are used currently in most operational system for the yield estimation. Biophysical variables are used not to directly estimate the yield, but to assess the crop conditions. Of course, the coming of the Sentinel missions, which are operational missions at high spatial resolution, is changing the game. Because again, when you are working at high spatial resolution, you can have a signal which is uh, at the level of the field, and so you can be crop specific. And now you can expect to have some link between the signal that you observe and the yield. But this is something which is rather new. It opens a lot of new opportunities. There are a lot of researches in this field for the moment, also new challenges. And so this is why I, I said at the beginning that uh, there are some methodologies that are emerging, but we are not yet at the stage to be uh, really operational with high resolution data. So with high resolution data, the objective is, is to be able really to use the signal as a proxy of the crop yield. And to do so, there are three main kinds of methodologies which are listed here. So the first one is the simplest one. You will define a, a relationship, linear relationship between your signal and the crop yield. And you will adjust this relationship. The uh, second uh, family, the second kind of methodology, uh, relies on the use of a semi-empirical model of uh, using the light use efficiency concept introduced by Monte. And the third uh, kind of uh, methodology here is making use of a crop uh, growing model and uh, it assimilates biophysical variables to constrain the phenological cycle of the crop. So these two uh, family, the, the, the second and the third family I have mentioned are a bit more complex. They rely on model. Uh, I will not have the time to explain them properly. And so I prefer just mention it, but not uh, presenting it in the print. Pre uh, sorry, I prefer just uh, mentioning them, but not presenting them um, in this session. I will focus on, on, the, first, um, on the first family, which is uh, the regression. So it consists in building a relationship between your signal and the crop yield. This kind of methodology has been tried since a lot of years. At the beginning, starting mainly with NDVI, as you can see. In the recent years, more and more biophysical variables have been tested, like uh, all the LAI that you have seen today, but also the green chlorophyll vegetation index and so on and so on. Why? Because higher spatial resolution are, they are, are coming. These methodologies are very simple and they are effective, but, and this is why they are so widely used, in fact. But you should know that the main limitation of these methodologies is that they will be valid only locally. So you will adjust your regression over the area that you are working on. But this is most likely that if you want to transpose this relationship to another uh, another region, it will not work. 
because when you define your uh, relationship on your area, in fact, you take into account the specific conditions of this area, specific type of soil, specific uh, amount of precipitation, specific temperature, specific agricultural practices, etc., etc. And these conditions will not be the same in another region of the world, and that will impact the efficiency of the, the performance of the relationship that you have defined. So this uh, empirical uh, empirical um, relationship method, method is quite effective, quite simple, but valid only locally. I will show you an example of, of, of this uh, methodology in Mali, where uh, we uh, have linked the crop yield with the maximum LEI. So we were working so in Mali, focusing on four crops, which were the sorghum, the millet, the maize, and the cotton. We had the chance to have uh, some ground to go to the field and so to collect uh, some uh, ground data about the yield and about the above ground biomass. And uh, the what we can see here is that there is really a strong link between this above ground biomass and the yield, which is a good news. This strong link happens for the four crop types. And this is a good news because here the idea is to find a good proxy based on your data on the above ground biomass. And if we find a good proxy, we could expect having also a good link between this EO proxy and the yield. So what we did in this study is that we tested a lot of vegetation indices or biophysical variables. At the end, we only kept uh, the LEI. So LEI proved to be the uh, one that performed best for all the crop types. And we calibrated for each crop type specific linear regressions between not the full cycle of LEI, but the maximum value of the LEI during the season and uh, the yield. So we, to, to calibrate the uh, linear regressions, we only used the, uh, you can see here, the black dots, which correspond to the uh, most homogeneous fields. And so this is really promising. We had a good relationship between these maximum LAI and the yield. And so this was a, a very interesting study showing the potential of the biophysical variables to estimate the yield when we are crop specific. It means when we are uh, working with high resolution data. It really shows that uh, the biophysical variables can be really useful to do more than just assessing the crop conditions if we are crop specific. And so it confirms really um, the high interest we should have uh, in, this, uh, in this domain to improve the methodologies and to move to operational uh, systems. So we are coming to the last uh, section of this training, where I would like to inform you, to advertise you, about three open source toolboxes that were funded by the European Space Agency, uh, which are named Cent to Agri, Cent for CAP, and Cent for STAT. So these toolboxes are specially designed to uh, use EO data in the field of agriculture monitoring. Just to start introducing this section, I would like to come back to the um, second lesson you had in this uh, in this uh, in in this uh, in this training, which was about uh, the optical uh, data pre-processing given by Magdalena and Fabrizio. So during this training, you learned how to calculate uh, the spectral indices and the biophysical variables uh, from an image of Sentinel-2 using the SNAP toolbox. So you see that this is not really complicated if you have a software which includes this functionality and most of the software will include this functionality. You take your pre-processed L2A image and you can calculate any radiometric index. So you can see here the long list of vegetation index, not only NDVI, and the same for the biophysical variables, LEI, FAPAR, F-cover, etc. This is done, you did it for one image. You can imagine that if we want to move to operational systems where you have to monitor a country, 
along the season in real time, having this kind of tools will not be enough. You, because the area that you will monitor will cover a lot of images and will these images will be acquired every day, every two days, every three days. And so there are a lot of images, a lot of data that, we, that will need to be processed. And also a lot of processing that will be that that will need to be done to uh, generate the information that you need. You don't need only the pre-processed data. You don't need only the LAI. You need the information, useful information coming from uh, this uh, processing. And so this is exactly the reason why uh, ESA developed uh, these toolboxes. So these toolboxes are there to support uh, operational processing of a large amount of data and to generate products, agricultural products that are directly useful for different kinds of applications. We can start with the Centu Agri system. So the Centu Agri system has a top priority. So it has been developed for agriculture monitoring. And so the, its objective is to automatically deliver four kinds of agricultural products in real time along the season using optical data, Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8. You can see here the four products that um, it is generating. So cloud-free composites, cropland mask, so binary map, a 10 meter special resolution for each pixel. This map will tell you if you are in a cropland or not. So these maps are provided several times during the year. So it evolves if you have different crops within your season, within your year you will uh, have an evolution of this, of this mask. You will also see the pixel coming from non-cropland to cropland when the crops are emerging. So this is quite a uh, quite dynamic product. Then you have a crop type map, uh, which is produced twice dur during the season, at the mid-season and at the end of the season. And here for each 10 meter pixel, you will get informed if uh, the crop type, uh, what, what the crop type is. And the last product, it was, is called the vegetation status. And so this product corresponds to the vari four variables uh, that were introduced to you today uh, that describe the crop growing cycle. So basically, NDVI, FAPAR, LAI, and FCOVER that you know perfectly well and that I don't need to uh, remind you here. So the Centuagri toolbox, what is it doing exactly? So this uh, is doing all the steps that are needed to generate these products at the end. And it is doing all the steps automatically. It means that it starts from the level one data. It manages, it deals with the atmospheric correction, with the cloud detection of all the dates automatically. And then each time you have a pre-processed data, it ingests them and it generates the composite, the cropland mask, the crop type map, and the biophysical variables. So everything is handled automatically. The system, the toolbox has been demonstrated. It means that it is not just there implemented and then you test it. No, we tested it and it was assessed by real users in different places of the world, even in countries, countries uh, national scale. It can be run on the cloud but it can also be run locally and it can be run really in near real time along the season. Or of course, if you are not interested in the near real time, you can use it uh, offline. Everything is available on the website here. So the system can be downloaded with uh, a lot of documentation. And so in practice, once you have installed your system, you need to parameterize it with only three very simple information. The first one is your area of interest. You need to upload a shape file with the polygon. Then you need to define the monitoring period, the start and the end dates of the period you want to monitor. And you need to define if you want to use Sentinel-2 only or also at Landsat-8. And that's it. When the system is parameterized, it starts running. Just one word, if, if you are interested in the crop maps, you will be asked to uh, upload also some ground data 
uh, about the crop types to calibrate the classification algorithm. But this is not really uh, the focus today. So coming back here, when you have put your parameterization, you can just start the system. And so the system will start. It will automatically download any data which is available, pre-process them, and when there is a pre-processed data, generate automatically all the biophysical variables. And so you will build your time series of biophysical variables automatically along the season. And with these time series that, that are available, you can really monitor the evolution of the crops uh, in uh, along the season. So this is here an example in Ukraine. At 10 meters, you can see that we see perfectly uh, the signal at the field level, and you can follow the evolution of the vegetation along the season with, sorry, no vegetation uh, at the beginning of the season in February. And then uh, in April, the crop starts emerging on more and more fields. In June, the vegetation is uh, there in many fields, and from July, the field started to be harvested, and the harvest is uh, finished in September. This is another example in South Africa, where the landscape is a bit more complex with some irrigation plots. And you can see again the evolution of the vegetation very clearly. And because we uh, are really at the level of the field, when you uh, uh, have this kind of time series, you can just uh, average all the pixels of a field and build a very clean time series because you average and then you smooth a lot. And so you can get your LAI profile for fields and follow uh, in a very clear manner the evolution of the vegetation. You can see here there are some gaps. This is certainly due to cloud coverage, which is the limitation of working with optical data. The last example, which is a bit more advanced, because here we will not look at all the fields altogether, but we will mask all the um, some 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 crop type. So it means that we have a crop type map that has been also generated by Centuagri, and we will focus on a given crop, and we will observe the LAI evolution only over a specific crop. And so you can see that the signal is really homogeneous. Evolution of the vegetation is the same over all. These, uh, these fields. And so combining the different products of Centuagri, the biophysical variables with the crop type map, for instance, allows you moving one step forward in your analysis of the practices and, and, and of uh, the growing cycles. So this Centuagri system, as I told you, can work on the cloud. This is even available in some operational cloud, commercial cloud, like you can see here. And uh, for instance, this is used by the World Food Programme operationally uh, to feed this early warning system. So this is really something that uh, is useful, is working, and has been uptaken by, by, by users. To um, the, the second toolbox, and then it will I will be uh, I will be shorter. The second toolbox, which um, has been funded by the European Space Agency, is Send for Cap. Of course, it builds on Centuagri. But uh, it is a kind of evolution of Centuagri. Why? First, because it includes also Sentinel-1. So you get Sentinel-2, Landsat-8. But you can see here that also Sentinel-1 is uh, supported by this toolbox, the pre-processing, but also the uh, integration of the Sentinel-1 signal in all the products with Sentinel-2. So this is really uh, something new with respect to, Sentin to Centuagri. And the specificity of send for cap is that uh, um, it uh, interprets the Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 uh, signal, not only to do crop type mapping, so this is included, but not only, not only to generate the biophysical variables, it is also included, you can also generate your LAI, FAPAR and cover in this toolbox, but it has added the agricultural practices monitor, uh, monitoring. So the grassland mowing, uh, the um, harvest, the cover crop, the tillage that I have mentioned before. So the monitoring of these practices, the detection of these practices at the field level 
are included in this uh, toolbox. And finally, the last uh, toolbox, and this to toolbox is still under development, while the other two ones are available on, uh, on the web. So the, the third one is the Send for Stat, also building on Send to Agri, on Send for Cap. Uh, so this is uh, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 also. The pre-processing is included. You continue having uh, some crop mapping. You continue having uh, the spectral indices and the biophysical variables. Uh, but what is new is that you have also the crop yield estimation. I told you that we are really in the field of having methods that are more and more mature to make the link between the uh, variables and the yields. So there is a first attempt here. Uh, and there is also a new module um, focusing on the quality control of the ground data, which is very important. And so with all this combination uh, of, of modules, the objective is here to have some products that can support the uh, agricultural statistics uh, calculation by the national statistical offices. This, uh, and I think it's the, that's it. Um, yeah. I have presented you the three toolboxes and the other applications, phenometrics, agricultural practices monitoring, the crop yield, and some tools that uh, could be useful to if you are interested in working in this domain. Would you have any questions? Please enter them in the QA box and we will answer them as soon as they arrive. In the meantime, some uh, information. So, of course, you get your or email address to Pierre and myself. And I have also uh, mentioned the websites of the uh, Centuary, Send for Cap, and for Stat toolboxes. So, these toolboxes are uh, the Centuary and the Send for Cap are available um, on the website. They are validated, they are demonstrated, they are used by users. There is a forum, there are webinars, and so on. So this is quite active. You can have a look. Feel free to make a try. The Send for Stat toolbox is coming. So this is an ongoing project. Um, that will be for probably uh, 2022. Thank you very much for your attention. And we are waiting for your questions. So this concludes this uh, webinar series. And uh, just as a reminder about the material that we've covered. There have been many different aspects of um, the use of remote sensing applied to agriculture that we've talked about, starting with a review of synthetic aperture radar and the signal interaction under different agricultural conditions. Then um, this presentation was by Dr. Heather McNairn of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. This was followed by a review of optical satellite imagery and how it can be used for agricultural applications followed by a demonstration on how to process optical imagery in SNAP. And this was a presentation by Fra Fabrizio Ramoino and Magdalena Fitzik, both from the European Space Agency. The third session covered the, the a first part of an operational guide for a roadmap for crop mapping. And that third session was um, done by Dr. Dingle Robertson from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, and it covered primarily the radar part of that operational roadmap. The fourth session, which was the second part of the operational roadmap for crop mapping, was by our colleagues from the European Space Agency by Teresa Roth, and she gave an excellent overview of different classifiers and a Python demonstration on how to uh, classify crops using optical data. And that session was uh, complemented uh, with a uh, presentation by Dr. Dingle Robertson on how to generate a final classification product. And then today's session was uh, an ex excellent summary on the uh, different biophysical variables and how you extract them. So by uh, Professor uh, Defourny and uh, Dr. Bontamp. So uh, this is a, a great uh, material that you can now take and adapt to your needs and to your areas of interest. And you can build on this material. 
Um, this is probably the first session we're considering a, a second session on agriculture sometime next year. So keep tuned uh, on the upcoming RSET trainings. But if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to any of the instructors during this webinar series. If you have any questions, please post them in the question window and we will answer your questions in the order that they were received. We've already been collecting the questions that we've been receiving and we have been putting them in a Google Doc, which we will share with you shortly. And we will post this Google Doc on the RSET training uh, page shortly after the conclusion of this session. I would like to thank all participants, and I would especially like to thank Professor Defouni and Dr. Bontemp for their excellent presentation. And now we are ready to start the question and answer session. And we have uh, Professor Defourny and Dr. Bontemp live, so they will be responding to your questions. I'll just make my way down the document. Question number one. For the radiometric indices calculation, when you say the reflection in a band, for example, is it actually the average reflectance in that region? So I'll let uh, either Professor Defourny or Dr. Bontemp answer. Please go ahead. And thank you for the question. And uh, good morning, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, the reflectance value, which is computed for, I mean, which is used to compute the radiometric indices, correspond to the average reflectance indeed, but this is a simplified version of what is actually the, the measurement by the sensor. The reflectance average over the spectral bandwidth is actually a simplification because the actual sensitivity of the sensor may vary according to the wavelength. Therefore, you are right, but it is a, an approximation. Great, thank you. Question two, are agricultural crop classification techniques and principles applicable to natural vegetation as well? And if so, could you please indicate relevant publications or other sources? Okay, I can, I can answer this one. So good morning, good afternoon, everybody. So all the all the algorithms, all the concepts that were presented uh, during this uh, webinar, but also during the previous one, are valid for any land cover classification in in general. Uh, but uh, what is specific to the features you want to map is the 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 the, the features that will that will uh, select to be classified. Maybe the period that you will classify to focus on the vegetation cycle, etc. So this is more the uh, input data and the uh, parameters of the algorithm that will be specific to your applications, but the concepts are, are the same, yes. Great, question number three. What makes a spectral index successful in capturing specific vegetation or moisture? If we wanna design a custom spectral index, what would be needed to, for a successful creation of a spectral index? Can I take that one? Uh, there, was, there are several success criteria for creating a successful spectral index. The spectral band needs to be sensitive to the phenomena you want to tackle. It could be the red edge or the sphere, the short wave infrared for water, the red for bare soil. And the combination of these spectral band should be combined in a way that it facilitates the discrimination of the phenomena or by enhancing the difference in the spectral behavior in the different bands. Okay, question four. If we apply cloud removal algorithms, would it be okay or accurate to calculate the radiometric indices from the images? 
I can continue with this one and the answer is clear. Yes, you, you should apply the cloud removal before computing any radiometric index. So to be sure that the index are computed only using cloud-free surface reflectance values. Okay, question five. Can biophysical variables for soil brightness be used to quantify soil salinity? When the salinity is changing the soil surface color, then the soil brightness could indeed be related to the soil salinity. But assuming that all other influencing factors are constant, meaning that the soil roughness, the soil color, the soil preparation does not influence as well along with the salinity, the reflectance. But we have to be careful that all soil salinity are not at the surface level. Okay, question six. During field measurements of LAI, would you disturb the reflectance received by the satellite sensor? We understood the question saying that if I am on the field while the satellite is taking the picture or the measurement, uh, does it impact the measurement? Correct. But Actually, it does not impact that much because the size of this pixel is usually much larger than the size of a person measuring a LA on the ground. But still, indeed, you are right that it could be a concern if you consider image with submeter resolution. Okay, great point. Question seven What biophysical variable is best for monitoring time variations? of the non-photosynthetic, photosynthetically active part of the vegetation, such as branches and tree trunks. Yeah, this biophysical reference is referred to as a fractional cover of non-photosynthetic vegetation. There are landscape where it has been much studied, like in US and in Australia. And there are some dedicated spectral indices based on shortwave infrared bands that are often used for this purpose. There is a list there. The, the soil tillage index, for instance, is very specific to linear content. That kind of ID can, can help to address a non fossil synthetic vegetation. OK, question eight. Is this GIFOV field of view issue valid for ground sampling for water, such as in situ temperature measurement? And in such situations, how do you make sure about the satellite footprint measurement? Sophie? Yeah, so this is the, the issue is valid for all applications, especially those one which are based on wide swath sensors with wide angles and so on. And this is true that uh, the, uh, this, this topic is, is underestimated or not, take, not, not taken into account so often. So this, this is not especially checked in the application. While it can have impact on the correspondence between the signal and the ground data. And so, I don't know, Pierre, maybe you want to complement with the, the surface yeah. for, yeah. Yeah, when it comes to the surface temperature, in the term urban, it's a bit more complex because there is a surface air exchange, which is also influenced by air turbulence. And therefore, I mean, we have to be careful. This is the, the PSF and the concern of footprint is still quite valid, but it's even more complex in the thermal bands. Okay, question number nine. Is data acquired by drone or airplane LIDAR considered ground truth? Yes, indeed. Today, in many agricultural applications, UAV images or airplane images are considered as ground truth. And when it, when it comes to LIDAR, it's a very good reference information for height measurement, for instance, or it could also help to recognize crop and therefore it can be used as a ground truth. 
Great, question 10. This is a question related to comparing crop phenology, the best way to compare crop phenology using remote sensing time series. So what is, which approach has the best performance? Classifying crops using phenometrics like minimum or amplitude, or just measuring time series distance with something like RMS? So this is indeed a very good, a very good question. And the answer is it will depend on your application. So if the application is to do near real time monitoring of the growing cycle, for instance, so the best approach is certainly uh, the comparison of the time series with the objective to detect any anomalies. Um, the map mapping approach will be used in, in other contexts where you are interested, for instance, to identify the crops that have the same phenology within an area of interest. Uh, to understand seasonal dynamics within your region, uh, to map the different uh, phenological stages within your region, uh, or even to group, as it was shown in, in, in one example in China, to group the different crop species based on, on their phenology. So there is no one best approach. It, it, will, re it will really depend on what you, on what you intend to, to do with this phenological information. Okay, question 11. For time series analysis, how do you obtain the NDVI time profiles? First, to have a clean NDVI profile, you should only include cloud-free atmospherically corrected observation. But even so, these are disconnected value. And to have a smooth line, it can be interpolated using one of the various algorithms like the Savisky gole methods or the spline approach, which are mathematical methods for smoothing line. Okay, question 12. Is it possible to get support for setting up a Python environment for using SNAP in case someone gets stuck? So neither Pierre nor me are SNAP experts. So uh, the best advice is to contact the support team of, of the SNAP toolbox through the forum. So they are very active. Uh, the community of users is, is huge. Um, and you can maybe already find some answers in the previous discussion. But in, in any case, there is a dedicated uh, team on ESA supporting the users uh, that, that, can, uh, that can help you on that. Great. Question 13. I didn't understand the derivation of a map to how to derive a map from phenometric analysis and what will this map indicate? A phenometric map would, for instance, show, show the date of the start of the season, which is a phenometric uh, variable uh, for each pixel of the image. And therefore, you can imagine an image and a map displaying in different colors the different dates of start of the season, showing the spatial diversity of the start of the season, for instance. And this, therefore, this could be the same for any other phenometrics. You display dates typically or length of the season and so on. Okay, question 14. Is this approach applicable to trees? So this is, uh, this is the same answer than at the beginning question two. So the approach uh, of classification um, is, is, is um, phen phenological analysis is the same uh, for any kind of vegetation, in this case for the phenology, any kind of vegetation that shows a seasonality um, so you can have, um, you, you can apply the, the same concept. There are phenological products existing, and I put two examples of global products uh, or pan-European products that monitor the phenology, um, not focusing on crop. Then what becomes really in, interesting in the field of uh, in, in in agriculture is when you can do this crop growing monitoring. Um, at um, in, a, in a crop specific way and to to have a to have a signal which 
which is specific to a given crop. But the approach is the same for any kind of, of uh, vegetation. Yes. Good. Okay, question 15. Can you share how you achieved these field level results? So in the in the examples that were shown in the in the slides, uh, it comes from the Send for Cap project. Many of them for the agricultural practices monitoring, and so you should know that in Europe uh, we have the chains that uh, field fields delineation is available in most of the countries, and so here we uh, we are not working pixel based, but we uh, were working at the level of the fields. So we uh, calculated the average of NDVI or the average of the backscatter of the or the currents uh, to make the to make the analysis. This is this okay. is an input. Yeah. No, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. Question number sixteen. What are the triangles in the mowing detection graph? So this was so this was a this is a very specific question. So I don't know if you remember the graph, but uh, the tri the yellow triangles correspond to the not the date of the detection, but the period of the detection of the mowing. So the detection is not um, provided as a unique date, but uh, we we put a start and end date of the period during which the mowing is detected because there is a, a, a consolidation of the detection and making that we wait for a second uh, observation coming either from Sentinel-2 or from Sentinel-1. And so the, the, the dating is on a period basis and not uh, on a single date basis. All right, question 17 focused on coastal. Can biophysical parameters such as biomass, biomass also be measured be used to measure subaquatic plant species so, such as seagrass. We do not have any experience in subaquatic measurement by satellite. Maybe around the table of the panelists, some panelists do have some experience. It would be more welcome to comment. Uh, what we can say is, of course, there is a notion color community observing the water chlorophyll content by satellite. And this is a very active research field where probably you may find your answer. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, question 18. In, in the mowing detection graphs, how do you attribute a single NDVI value to a parcel? Do you average the NDVI values for every pixel on the parcel, or do you calculate some other statistics? And how do you deal with non-homogeneous parcels? So the, the NDVI, um, as I just explained, the NDVI signal is uh, averaged at the parcel level. So the parcel boundary is an input of the analysis. Uh, and when we do this average, we removed the boundaries pixels, so the pixels which do not have the centroid within uh, the, um, the the parcel. And so, uh, for, so, yeah, so this is an average. Um, regarding the question on the homogeneity of this parcel, here we assumed that all the parcels were homogeneous. Uh, we know that the data sets uh, shall be qualified and checked uh, in each country at a minimum every three years. So this was a general assumption. In practice, we realized that, uh, of course, not all boundaries are perfect. And so we got the case of heterogeneous parcels. And there are method methodologies that allow assessing the parcels homogeneity based, for instance, on, on checking the standard deviation on NDVI, uh, the coefficient of variation of, of, of the currents. And, and these, uh, let's say, check of the Brussels homogeneity sh should be applied as an a priori, so before doing any uh, detection of, of events to focus only on the Brussels, which are homogeneous. But this was here in, in, in the experiment, the assumption was that all the Brussels were homogeneous. 
Okay, question 19. What do you mean by coherence with SAR data? So, the, I don't know, Pierre, do you want to answer? Or? Sure, thank you. The coherence is a variable derived from a pair of SAR observations based on the inter interferometric methods, which are rather complex, uh, let's say, methods using SLC dataset. The coherence is actually computed from two SAR images recorded by exactly the same instrument and following closely each other, typically at six days apart from the same Sentinel-1. And finally, the coherence expresses the similarity of the radar reflection between them. And this is why you can see that the coherence is increasing when there is no movement of the vegetation from one day to another, allowing to detect that we have a bare soil. But if we have vegetation, there will be movement in the vegetation, and therefore the reflection will not be exactly similar, and the coherence will be lower. Okay, question 20. In recent years, there's an increasing tendency to plant two or more crops in the same season, multi-cropping, and several varieties of cover crops to protect soil from erosion. Are these practices taken into account, or do you assume that only one crop at a time is grown and harvested in a certain field? So I can start answering with really the, the examples that were shown in, in, in the presentation. So in the presentation, so there we assumed, and so this was mentioned like this by the farmers, that there is only one crop at a time grown and harvested in a certain field. Um, and so the detection uh, was done based on this assumption because the information was provided by the farmer. In, in case of several crops, uh, then we, of course, we should know more about, uh, the, for instance, the proportion between these two crops uh, to be able to adapt the approach. Um, we, we do not need to know exactly which crop it is to be able to do uh, the detection of an, uh, of an event like an harvest, a mowing, etc. Um, so yeah, so it, it will really it will really depend on the application if we need to know what are the different crops uh, on the field in the case of multi-cropping. Multi in the case of a classification for multi, in the case of a classification of, of multi-cropping, for instance, um, the different crops associate, on the, associated on the same field might become uh, a single legend item to be classified with, because it will have a, a specific spectral signal, for instance. So yeah, it really depends on the application. Thank you, Sophie. Okay. But I would also add that I understood the question a bit differently, that if we have several crops following each other during the season, like a main crop, then a cover crops, then actually this is handled by the system. I mean, the agriculture practice can handle the the, the fact that there is two sequential crops. Yes, this one. Yes, sequential crop on the uh, on the same field. Yes, this is this is fully addressed. All right. Okay. Question twenty one: Is NDVI enough to detect harvest, or do we need other biophysical parameters? Um, so we did different tests uh, using NDVI, using LAI, using FAPAR, uh, even if cover was tested. Um, NDVI was proved to be enough, so it could be complemented by LAI. LAI was, was the, 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 the other uh, most powerful biophysical variable uh, in, in the case of, of the arrest. Um, yeah, the best complementary approach did not come, in fact, from uh, an optical uh, variable, but from a SAR variable to address the issue of the cloud cover. So, because yes, the detection of the arrest will be uh, accurate if you get a dense time series, if you do not have a too long gap because of the cloud. And so, in this way, the highest complementarity was obtained by combining 
well, it was NDVI, but it could have been LAI. But by combining this uh, one optical index with SAR based indices. Okay. Question 22 Regarding the harvest time, is it best seen when the slope is starting to go down? or the value of NDVI starts reducing, or is it best seen when the NDVI value reduces to a minimum? Now, regarding crop classification, is there a step-by-step -step manual that can be accessed that explains um, quickly? I will take the first part. The NDVI value start reducing during the maturity phase much before the harvest time, because the plant becomes senescent to, to fill the grain, and therefore the, the drop of NDVI is not uh, ne, uh, sufficient information, but this is a prerequisite information to detect the harvest time. The coherence increase is ne necessary to make sure that the mature crop is harvested, harvested and identified fairly the day. But of course, as we just explained in the previous question, in most cases, we know that the, the crop will be harvested. And therefore, when we end the, the drop of the NDVI, this would be enough. But if we, have, we are in the landscape where some crop may not be harvested, the, probably the coherence is really a, a complementary information. Now, with regard to the manual, to explain a step-by-step -step procedure. Uh, I don't know, Sophie, if you want to comment on that or? So, well, the, the classification was not really addressed in the presentation because uh, I guess you, 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 you will get a lot of information about the classification in the previous uh, sessions of these webinars. So the, the algorithm which is implemented in, in Sand for Cap is a random forest algorithm. So there, is, uh, there are some documents on the Central Cap website, um, this description of the algorithm. Uh, there is a user manual of the processor which goes step by step. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this is, there is nothing uh, original in the algorithm which uh, is, uh, has been used in, in, these, uh, in these examples. This is why we did not put too much focus on that. Okay, question 23, what is the reason that earth observing technology for crop yield estimation is limited to coarse spatial resolution? Can't the same parameters be used for the estimation of uh, independent estimation if it's based on coarse or fine resolution data? Um, maybe I can start and, and Pierre, you, you may complement if you want. So, um, the, the main message was that in terms of operational applications, many of them, most of them are based on course resolution for historical reasons. Uh, first one is that because simply uh, high resolution, free of charge, uh, high resolution sensors free of, of charge uh, were not so, <laughs> were, were not so uh, available. They were only Landsat until uh, the, the coming of the Copernicus Sentinels mission. Uh, while you get you got uh, the MODIS, the HRR, etc. Before, so this is why uh, this this is why um, operational applications were based on cross spatial resolution. Also, because the operational applications usually address questions at a national scale or even regional continental scale, and so in terms of data processing, this is uh, a much a much higher challenge to work with high resolution data. Now, in terms of, 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 of technology, um, the, or in terms of methodology, uh, so what will change when you move to fine resolution data is that you can get a crop specific signal. Uh, and this is especially the case when you use Sentinel-2 with the 10 meter resolution. And then you can, in fact, uh, expect much more information uh, than, than working with MODIS at 250 meters. Uh, with the white SWAT effect, when you look at the pixel, in fact, you know that you observe different pixels, probably planted with different crop types. And so the questions are not the same, not totally the same, working at high resolution or working at coarse resolution. 
but this is yeah this is coming and and this is uh, there are, there are more and more demonstrations papers showing the possibilities of 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 yield estimation using sentinel sentinel data great okay Question 24, how far is the development and application of AI or machine learning approaches for classification, combining reflectance data with phenological development from time series? And if so, are there any lessons learned on where this works and where it doesn't? That's a good question. Up to date, the machine learning like random forest is currently the standard classification methods for classification. And, and uh, as you have learned that in the, the part three, I believe, of this training, uh, the phenometrics can surely be used as an input to this machine, machine learning algorithm. Now, when it comes to artificial intelligence, strictly speaking, the deep learning, uh, this is currently a very active field of research showing some very great successes but also challenges. For instance, you need a very large calibration data set. And as you know, agriculture is changing every year. And therefore, this is tedious or heavy. And also, there is a limited transferability of these AI models from one, re one region to another or from one season to another. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this is where the research activities are taking place today. Okay, question 25. Can we use CubeSats for yield estimation? I would say that, yeah, there is no reason for which you could not use CubeSats, so yes, you could use it. The only limitation will be the fact that these data are not free of charge, and so your ARI will probably be limited, uh, and this will be more R&D than operational applications, but yeah, but the, yeah, the image can certainly be used also in this kind of application. Okay, question 26. Sometimes ground truth data is difficult to collect, such as in remote areas with difficult accessibility. Are there any good examples using col uh, collecting like surrogate ground truth using planes or mid long range drones? So I guess this is related to a previous question. Yes, and, and the answer is, is yes. Um, in in Sent to Agree within the user community we, we got, there are several examples of in-situ data collection carried out by UAVs or by light aircraft. Uh, I put some um, a, a webinar presentation of Sent to Agree where uh, the example of South Africa is uh, shown. So in South Africa, they are doing uh, each year a ground data collection using light aircraft. Um, and so there are some details in the presentation. We also know that the World Food Programme, uh, which is using Centuagri, in some um, of the country where they operate, they are not able to go to the field anyway because of security reasons, because of uh, the accessibility. And they are testing, uh, they have tested uh, successfully the use of UAV images to collect uh, in situ data. So there are different examples. I, I just put two. Uh, I mentioned also one example in Tanzania, if I remember correctly, uh, where this year there were a field campaign uh, also using UAV images. So definitely, yes, this is possible. Question 27. Do the different dots in the graph where you link yield and max LAI represent the different locations of a particular crop type? Yes, indeed. This refers to the Mali study, and uh, each dot was corresponding to an elementary sampling unit measured on the ground. And we have to keep in mind that each graph is crop specific, therefore, there were a graph per crop. All right, question 28. So basically, we cannot accurately estimate the yield using remote sensing. Is that correct? We cannot agree exactly with this statement. The yield estimation system based on satellite observation, which are working operationally today, has been calibrated for a given context. Therefore, 
they've been they've been development to to provide yield estimation operationally, but this is more local application for a given region with given agricultural practices. It is, however, also common to combine many sources of information like crop growth modeling, agrometeorological indicators, trend analysis, in addition to the satellite remote sensing to provide yield estimation or at least crop condition all over the world. And I provide three links there where you have institutional uh, built-in providing information about the ongoing season all over the world. Okay, question 29. What is the accuracy of SNAP and LAI retrieval for different vegetation types, such as agriculture, forest, and grassland? So the, in SNAP, the LAI retrieval algorithm which is implemented is uh, the one based on BVNet approach, uh, which was introduced in, the in this presentation. And this BVNet approach is also the one implemented in Centro Agri and for CAP system. Um, so it was the, the so the algorithm is documented in the document where that uh, where for, for which I put the link here. And so the the validation of of this processor was done was done um, only on crops. If if my, if uh, I'm correct, so I'm not 100% sure, but I think that the validation so far. Has been done has been done only uh, over crops, uh, and so you get in 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 these documents some information already some graphics about the validation figures, and at the end you get some nice um, reference of papers focusing on on this validation uh, question. Okay, question number thirty: Does this system only work with Sentinel two or Landsat eight? Can we work with Sentinel-1 or Sentinel-2? So for the Sen-2 Agri system, this is working only with optical data from Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8. There is no Sentinel-1 in the Sen-2 Agri system. Sentinel-1 has been included uh, in the Central Cap system with the, uh, let's say, uh, speci the, the specificity that uh, in Central Cap you need to work by object and not by pixel. Uh, in the coming Sanforstat system, which is not yet available, Sentinel-1 will also be included for, following a per-pixel approach. So this is a kind of evolution between the different tools. Okay, question 31. Does Sent2 Agri include forest cover types as well? So the Sent2 Agri includes a processor uh, which allows per-pixel classification uh, within um, the project we qualified and we uh, demonstrated the processor in the specific context of, of crop classification, but uh, it can be used for any type of classification, forest or other cover types, etc. And so in the user community, we have some success, successful examples of uh, uh, using the processor for general land cover mapping uh, in Indonesia, for instance, or forest type classification. So this was this was done. By, by other users. Okay, question 32, along sent to agri can we extract sent to agri products from past years, assuming that I have past year's training data? Yes, indeed. Eh? The sent to agri can be run in real time, as, as Sophie explained, but also offline, allowing to process any archive data from previous year, providing the fact that you have the necessary information for the crop classification. Okay, question 33. For crop growth monitoring and near real time system operation, can you provide more detailed validation and accuracy results using the Sent to Agri? So, crop growth monitoring in Sent to Agri is based on uh, the monitoring of LAI, uh, FAPAR, FCOVER, which, which are provided by the BVNet algorithm. And so this is uh, related to the question we, we just answered. So there are some documents providing so, some uh, so, some validation figures. In the project, we did the validation uh, using ground data in Belgium, and this validation confirmed a very good performance um, of, of, of the algorithm. But uh, yeah, 
each validation is really crop specific and, and specific also to a region. Okay, question 34. How much training data should we have for sent to agri crop type to work? This is a very good question. Maybe Pierre, you can start. This is a, a good question, but this has to be designed according to the area of interest. More diverse is your area of interest for the classification, more you will need uh, training data. We know that you, you typically need a few hundreds of each crop type to capture the diversity when you process a national scale, but it can go up to a few thousands. All right, thank you. Maybe if, if, can, if oh, sorry, I, sorry. So um, I can put the link in the document uh, just after, but there was a sent to agri webinar on this topic uh, where we provided some guidelines to um, quantify a bit the uh, the amount of training data uh, you needed by crop type uh, and assuming that you can potentially stratify your country also. And so I can make the link to this presentation, uh, which provides some quantitative information, but they need to be interpreted as guidelines that need to be, of course, uh, it's considered in, in each specific context. Yeah, absolutely. Question 35, can send for cap be used for other areas other than the pilot areas? Can it be used, for example, for Ireland or the UK? So yes, definitively yes. The Sun for Cap is a toolbox uh, that can run in any place, even outside of Europe. Uh, the only limit constraint, I would say, is that we need to have object boundaries. So this is a system which follows an object-based approach. But if not, it can be run in any place of the world. Great. Question 36. Can we download products from Send4Cap using shapefiles? Do the products have global coverage? Maybe just to clarify, the Send4Cap is, is a toolbox. This is not a set of products. So there are no products that you can download from Send4Cap. You need to download the, the toolbox and to uh, run the toolbox by yourself to generate your own products. Okay, good clarification there. Uh, question 37, to use SAR biophysical parameters, do we also need to collect field data or are we just relying on the coherence data mentioned earlier? So there is no, it, it, it really depends on the algorithm which is used to derive the biophysical parameters. So from for Sentinel-2, so the biophysical parameters are derived from the BVNet approach and there is no need of in situ data uh, to derive these, these uh, biophysical parameters. Here in the question, it seems that um, the, the question refers to current data. And uh, so to derive current data, there is no need to, uh, or there is no need for field data. So this is difficult to provide a generic answer. It depends on the parameters and on the method which is used to derive it. Okay, question 38. Can we exclude agroforestry from cropland with Sentinel-2 or Sentinel-1 images through crop classification? I'll take that one if you want, Sophie. Uh, this will depend on your agroforestry patterns. If you have major fields, uh, major trees in, in your in your uh, agricultural land, then of course you can capture these these trees using high resolution imagery. If these are some uh, linear linear feature which are very narrow, then it will be very difficult to take out the agroforestry feature out of the cropland. Therefore, this is very much a matter of Special resolution, much more than uh, optical or SAR information. 
Okay, question 39. Can soil types be identified using indices? And if so, which indices are preferable for this? And this is a difficult question because if you are soil scientists, you will know that the soil type are not referring to the soil color. And therefore, they are referring to the soil profile, uh, the depth of the soil, the drainage of the soil, and so on. But in some places, soil type can be related to the soil color. And in this case, we can say that we can have a kind of coarse information about the soil type based on the, soil co the, the surface color. Uh, and in terms of the indices, it really depends on the area that you are looking at. Okay. Could be bright, could be brightness. Uh -huh. actually. I'm sorry, go ahead. It could be a soil brightness index, for instance. All right, question 40. Is the crop phenology region specific or is it global? And can the phenology of a crop change uh, with time or is it the same every year? We can, we can say that the phenology is completely variable from one place to another, from a species to another, from a season to another. There is no, not uh, uh, an identical agriculture season. But of course, there are crop calendar, which give us an idea of when a plant is sown, when a plant is harvested. But these are not crop phenometrics. These are crop calendar. And about the difference uh, between years, this is exactly the interest of monitoring the phenology uh, to know how the crops will behave uh, this year compared to previous years. So all the early warning systems, for instance, are based on, on this uh, monitoring of the current crop conditions and the comparison with the previous years to detect any anomaly. Okay, question 41. How do you get the biophysical parameters of the lower canopy in case of intercropping? If the in intercropping are, have the same phenology, meaning they are green at the same time, then there is no way you can separate the the underneath crop, I mean the lower canopy, uh, with regard to the other one. It will be combined in your biophysical variables, and therefore the LAI will be a combined LAI, typically. Of course, if you have a very high resolution, and you can separate specially, because you see the row of the lower canopy and the row of the upper canopy, but this is very high resolution, which is needed to do so. Okay, question 42. What indices does one use to identify the possibility of pest infestation or over usage of water? Uh, this is, uh, these are topics of research. Pest infestation are related to the symptom on the leaf level or the structure, the internal structure of the leaf. Typically, this will be related to the red edge or the near infrared bands. If you, if you look in the presentation, there is a small illustration where we can see the senescence of the leaf, but past symptoms will be the same. Uh, now for the water, the NDWI is probably a good solution for the water stress. The over usage of water will not be visible in the plant at the plant level. Uh, and this will be probably related to the, the soil moisture, which could be detected by 
ça information. Okay. Question 43. Are there any indices that would help identify heavy metal stress using Sentinel data? To be honest, this one, I, I don't know. <laughs> I am not aware of any very specific one. Probably if you, if hyperspectral information is available, there would be maybe a, a possible pathway to do so. But with what we have as a broadband or narrow band sensor, this would be difficult. Hyperspectral information are very, very dense uh, information in terms of spectral bands. Okay, question 44. How do we quantify yield based on satellite imagery? Can you please share the steps? <laughs> As Sophie explained, I mean, there are several modeling approach, could be statistically based or mechanistically uh, modeling models. I think it would be, take too long to explain this again. Sophie, would you like to give the, the seminar again? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, but maybe just in, in very, very briefly, for the method that was, uh, let's say, detailed a bit more in, in, the, in the webinar, so you, you, you get some ground data and you need you, the, let's say, the success of the yield estimation is the capacity to find a good proxy, EO-based proxy, and that will have a good correlation with what, with your with your ground data, uh, and and then you can you can generalize uh, within your area of interest, and and assuming that you are in the same conditions than the conditions uh, where you have collected this field data. This is this is the drawback of working with in situ data is that you are very uh, dependent on the local conditions. But th this is the this is the method that was uh, detailed a little bit in the webinar. Okay, question forty five. Going back to heterogeneity, if you have two crop types in the parcel at the same time. How can I measure vegetation indices or biophysical variables? I think the answer is the same than for the intercropping. The vegetation indices and biophysical variables will provide a value combining both canopy cover, both canopy, uh, meaning that it will be the LAI for the combination of the vegetation of the two crops. Okay, question 46. Is the same crop mask applicable to all the crops? or on different continents? I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, I, I would say that you, it refers probably to, to saint Agri, where we introduce this concept of, of crop mask. So there is a, a crop mask which is generated over the region you want to monitor. And so the crop mask is valid, of course, only over this region but for all the types of crops and then the idea is that uh, first you generate your crop mask and then with this which within the area which is identified as cropland you can do the crop type classification and go one step further by identifying which is the crop type within your cropland area Okay, and the last question, and this pertains to the capacity of the software package to handle processing for a big coverage, big study area. Some software have limitations of input data, the number of training areas, for example, and they also need high capacity of uh, uh, high computer um, memory to work with. How about in the case of Send to Agri and the package? What sort of limitations are there in running large in running it over large study areas? So in fact, Centuary has 
uh, been running over very large areas, the full Mali, for instance, uh, in real time. And so this is, I, I must say that the limitation is, is not really the, uh, the number of training areas or the number of tiles that need to be processed. Uh, from the user perspective, uh, and from what I heard uh, on the on the on the forum, uh, the main limitation is maybe the fact that it's only working on on Linux on a Linux environment. But uh, in terms of amount of input data, there is no limitation. The limitation will be more uh, not not the limitation, but the difficulty will be to have a more uh, consistent in situ data set over large areas, meaning an uh, in situ data set that, that is representative of the full area you want to classify and that includes all the main crop types that you want to classify it, uh, in enough quantity. So, but this is more a challenge than, than a constraint. And we can add also that based on, on our experience, the capacity of the hardware is limiting if you are not on the cloud. But mm, yes. being on, on the cloud close to the data set make it possible. But if you have to download the data set for a large area or a country level in real time, this would be a major constraint. Okay, great point. So with that, we've reached the end of this session. Um, I would like to thank all participants for uh, their questions, their participation in this webinar series, and um, I remind them to please keep tuned for upcoming uh, similar uh, webinars next year. I would especially like to thank uh, Professor DeFourny and Dr. Bontemps for the excellent presentation today and the excellent handling of the questions. Um, so uh, before I close, uh, Professor DeFourny, would you like to say any closing words? Oh, I would like to thank you all for your attention, your very nice question, and your enthusiastic motivation for remote sensing in agriculture. We believe this is a booming sector and a lot, a lot is, is still to be developed. And we are very happy to have such an audience to make progress with you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Dr. Bontemps, would you like to say any closing words? This is more or less the same. So thank you very much uh, to the participants for the questions, um, for attending the webinar. And so also thank you uh, to you for the invitation and to give us the possibility to to share our experience on, on this topic. Thank you. It's really been an honor to have both of you here. So um, before I close, I'd like to thank the RSET team, um, Jonathan O'Brien, Selwyn hudson Odoi, and especially to Brock Blevins, and to RSET instructor Sean McCartney, who's played a big role in helping uh, put all of this together and with all the coordination. Um, so with that, then I close this webinar series. Uh, thank you again. Remember that the homework is now posted on the uh, training page for this webinar series, and it is due on November 2nd. Uh, wishing you all a great day and hoping that you can take this knowledge and tools and build on these for your areas of interest. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye-bye.